All right, uh, so here we go. I'm here with Roger Wagner, and uh, my name is Chris Torrance. And so, Roger, why don't you just tell us uh, who you are and kind of how you got started in the, the software industry? Okay. Um, uh, she said Roger Wagner. <laughs> um, I had, uh, at the beginning of the personal computer uh, time, I had um, been a classroom teacher, math and science, junior, senior. Math and, uh, math and science for junior, senior high school, taught chemistry, biology, that sort of thing. And um, I think the first computer I saw on the cover of a magazine was actually a PET, a Commodore PET. Uh, and as I recall, it was the Commodore PET 2000, it not being the year 2000. I have a feeling it might have been because of 2001, A Space Odyssey, and the 2000 sounded futuristic. So I think there was a Commodore PET 2000. And I had actually... Um, really was ready to go buy that and went to a computer store here in San Diego I think at the time it was one or maybe two and um, showed up and they the Commodore pet I think actually might even have been out on being demonstrated somewhere so I looked at the Apple and uh, the big selling point at that point was it had a real keyboard uh, see the feature list was pretty short in those days um, oh so anyway I had an idea um, the the pet was about eight hundred dollars. The Apple II was about fifteen hundred, and um, at the bottom of the promotional page, it said uh, "dealers wanted," dealerships invited, or something like that. So I thought, well, if I could convince a friend of mine to also buy one, then we could order two, and that would be like a dealer order, and we get it for half price. And the same as a Commodore PET, and we so maybe cool. So I called up Apple Computer, and they said, I think at the time they might even had a distributor, so they passed me on to uh, their distributor. And the, the guy was actually very nice. Like, he said, well, we want to come down and see your store. And I said, well, I don't have a store. And he said, well, that's okay. Why don't you go find somebody and convince them, find a store, and convince them to carry Apple Computers. And make some kind of deal with them. You know, maybe you'll put up the money for the, the demonstrator unit for a while. So anyway, that all sounded, that sounded interesting. And so that's what I ended up doing. I found a store in El Cajon. Um, I want to say it was called, it wasn't the Computer Merchant. Shoot, but they were selling a computer called the Sorcerer. Um, Exidy Sorcerer. They were in El Cajon. So I put up, basically I bought um, at least two apples, and ultimately I bought more than that. And I bought a suit and a briefcase, and uh, the only problem is I didn't know anything about business or computers. So I signed up for a class at the local community college on um, computers and discovered that it was all about punch cards and not personal computers. Uh, but So I ended up having a lot of time. I learned how to program. I started writing articles for magazines, and uh, we started Southwestern Data Systems. And I think around, 90, around 1984, uh, changed to Roger Wagner Publishing. That's how I got started. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Um, I guess one question is, what, what prompted you to change from like Southwestern Data Systems to Roger Wagner Publishing? Uh, because the industry was getting big enough, some people were actually selling their companies. And I wasn't a corporation. It was just a sole proprietorship. And somebody else actually was using Southwestern Data Systems somewhere. Um, so it had kind of a limited life <laughs> ahead of it. Um, by that time, I'd been writing the articles in Soft Talk magazine for a number of years, so my name was known. So we decided rather than just pick an arbitrary name, we'd call it Roger Wagner Publishing, and at least people would would then know know something about the company and the new name. That's great. Um, I guess related to the articles, so you were referring to the assembly lines articles mm -hmm. and in Soft Talk. How did that kind of come about? How did you get started writing those? Oh, um, I had, remember I was actually learning about computers myself. Um, and I got my first issue of Soft Talk magazine, and I had been publishing occasional articles in Call Apple. And somehow I must have been on the phone with, with Al Tomervik, and I, I don't remember the exact dialogue, but the net effect was, I think he said, well, why don't you write a column about it? I probably, I probably said something like, oh, I'm learning assembly language now. 
And he said, well, why don't you write a column about it? So I said, yes, um, with the knowledge that I actually didn't... I wasn't writing it from the standpoint of somebody who already knew. I was writing it from the standpoint of who was learning. And actually, that ended up being a tremendous asset. I think I have a theory to this day that if a person wanted to... Um, at least for me, wanted to, to write you know another successful book. If over the last, if over the course of my lifetime, every time I learned something new, I'd written the book while I was learning it, it would have been a completely different book and a very popular book. Because assembly lines had the biggest virtue wasn't just that it was the first for the Apple. There were other books for the 6502, but not for the Apple. The biggest virtue was I wasn't an, a computer engineer. I wasn't somebody that already mastered it. So to me, the things that were confusing were the things that were confusing to a beginner, and I could write about those. And I could explain what it, I could explain how, you know, how they were how they took shape or how how they made sense in my own mind as a beginner. And I actually think that was something something really special. I I think we sold maybe 50,000 copies of Assembly Lines the book. I mean, it was some huge number. I was shocked at the time. That's um, great. So that, that approach seemed to appeal to people. <laughs> All right, so uh, you mentioned uh, Al Tomrovic and also Margot Comstock. She was the editor. So did you ever get much opportunity to see them or other people in the, the field? Um, I didn't go up there a lot because I was in San Diego and they're in Los Angeles. It was still close enough that I got to go up there occasionally. I want to say they had events. So I, I, rem I remember meeting, at least I think I remember meeting, it's been a long time now, Bill Budge. Um, and because he did the uh, pinball or something, pinball, pinball construction so, set. Yeah, that's it. Yes. Pinball construction set. Yeah. And a number of the other people. Um, and then there were events event like Apple Fest, and I think a number of us would go to things like that. Right. Um, so that was fun. That's great. And then you, uh, it sounds like you also had an opportunity to, to kind of hang out or go on some trips with some of those people. Like, yeah. can you talk about that? Yeah, I did. Um, at one point, Ken Williams from Sierra Online, he was in uh, just outside of Yosemite. I think it was called Gold something. Uh, but anyway, where, where he was located. But uh, I can't remember offhand, but it was very, very close to Yosemite. So he organized a rafting trip and then just sent out. It was a very small community. We were really all very, pretty much the same age, I mean, in our 20s. Um, and so he wrote a letter to a bunch of people and said, hey, let's do a rafting trip. Um, so yeah, I went up to Yosemite and we went down some river there. Um, and the Carlsons were there, Doug, Doug and Gary Carlson, the Sierra Online people. Um, the, 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 my fun story from that was at some point the raft was being tossed about and it, it bounced and I was about to be launched out of the raft with, uh, I think my head about to be the stopping point on a big rock. And all I remember is, I, I think it was Gary Carlston, um, grabbed my shirt and just pulled me back on the boat. Um, which uh, is the way I like to tell the story. So he, uh, he, he may have affected the, uh, the future of of uh, certainly my future in personal computing uh, and whatever else may have come to pass as a result of that. Oh, that's great. Um, of course, I took that opportunity, I took the inspiration from that, and then I think the following year I organized a hang gliding, uh, sort of learn how to hang glide trip to Mexico. And so I wrote letters to everybody, and again, it was a small enough world that included Steve Jobs and Wozniak, and Jobs wrote a letter and said, no, sorry, I can't come. Um, but Waz will be there, and Burl Smith and Andy Hertzfeld, and Andy Hertzfeld, as I recall, was the one who also worked on Android, and I think he's the one who invented the Google Cir the Google Plus circles. Um, so they went on to a, a long and illustrious career. But there's a photograph floating around that shows all of us in front of a uh, a hang glider um, parked on on the sand in Mexico. That's great. And the fun part of it, I'll just add one other part to that story was since the Carlsons were there and Broderbund was a big game company, we're sitting in Mexico in a restaurant with our beers and laughing about crazy ideas. And I was just at that point actually doing one of our first games for my company, which was called Bizarre. And, and in it, the aliens are the good guys and the humans arriving are, are the enemy. So you have to defend yourself from arriving humans. 
Um, but we, we were just joking about games, and I said, oh, I know, I'll put in a work, I'll put in a, a special key press, like Command-W, and when you press that, it'll put up a spreadsheet. So if you're playing the game at work, you just press that, and instantly it'll look like you're in VisiCal, and you'll be cool. <laughs> and so I, to my knowledge, Bizarre was the first one that had the work key, and, uh, and then that uh, was actually showed up later in other games as well. Probably saved many people's jobs. I'm way. sure it did. I'm <laughs> sure it did. So, uh, just in general, um, you know, you mentioned a lot of different companies and people, mm -hmm. and, and what was the what was the industry like at the time? Like, I mean, what, did you uh, compared to maybe now or, or just back then, like the culture and the climate? Mm -hmm. How was it? How was it kind of different? Um, actually, I think the easiest way to understand it would be to look at things. In contemporary terms now, if you think about the maker movement, um, the people in Make Magazine or the people who are building drones generally are people in their 20s or people who are older but who are still experimenters and perhaps childlike at heart um, with that sense of exploration. The, the people doing maker things who are trying to, uh, you know, make a Nerf gun shoot at their... Uh, their their baby brother when they try to sneak in their room using an Arduino uh, aren't doing it with dreams of building a, a, a billion dollar empire. They, in, they enjoy making something that what didn't exist before. And we were doing that with computers. Computers were brand new. They didn't, computers hadn't been in the hands of 20 year old kids to do with whatever they wanted. And so the culture and climate was the same as the maker movement is today, it was different than the startup culture now, where people go out and raise millions of dollars for an app that will share photos of their cat, um, and they're hoping to make you know, even more. Uh, but it was it was really fun. Kansas Fest, where uh, we would go to uh, uh, Avila College in Kansas City and sleep in the dorm on paper thin sheets um, and stay up all night. Um, was really like being in a giant sleepover, because um, it was. And people would just stay up all night making things on, on the Apple and trying to be the first one to figure out how to do something that somebody didn't know yet how to do. That's great. And actually, there's a, a rumor, I think maybe you started, that at the Kansas Fest, uh, were you the one that started the, the Bite the Bag? or the? There, there's two, yeah. Uh -huh. Actually, there's the tie contest. Okay. So to this day, to the extent that at Kansas Fest, to my knowledge, uh, there is still a Roger Wagner tie contest at Kansas Fest. And, um, and then there was a game that I had picked up somewhere called Bite the Bag, where basically you have to pick up a paper bag with your teeth. And when the bag's this tall, it's not very hard to do. But after everybody picks up the bag, and then of course the fun part is the bag gets wet from people's mouths around the top, you tear off the inch, that's the slobbery part, um, and then you do it again. But the result is the bag starts getting shorter and shorter and shorter, which means it's closer. Oh, and then you, the rule is you, what is the rule? Shoot, the rule is you have to, right, you can't, you can't get down on all fours. I think there's a, the rule is you can only have one or two limbs. So you can have one foot on the ground. You could have two feet on the ground, but you can't have two feet and an arm. So you can't just bend over and put your hand down to support your weight. So that means you have to be either really flexible and just be able to bend 180 degrees you know, at your waist. Um, or there are elaborate moves where you, if you do a handstand, that's only two hands. So there is a special move where you do a handstand, walk over, and then pick up the bag with your teeth doing sort of a push-up in the middle of a handstand. Needless to say, that's a... Uh, yeah, maybe you'll have to come a, back a, to Yeah, Kansas that's a gold Fest star, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> demonstrate. Defend your yeah, title. Advance, or uh, yes, demonstrate <laughs> advanced bite the bag technique. It's right. <laughs> so, um, you know, back, back when you were kind of first developing all this software with all these other people, did you... Did you or anyone kind of have a sense that you were on the, the cutting edge of, of technology? or um, In a way, yes, because it's, again, to draw an analogy, if you were building something with drones now, you would know you were on the cutting edge. You wouldn't necessarily know where they were all going, but where it was all going to go, but you would know that it was something really new and really special. 
Um, and so there was that sense with personal computers. We, we knew that there had been nothing like this available to people before. Um, and, and yet the cutting edge might be, you know, could you put text and graphics on the screen at the same time? <laughs> so, I mean, the things that were cutting edge then, I, one of the first, you know, one of the early articles I published was how to scroll text in both directions. Well, that's just pretty taken for granted these days, but there was, that article was published because at that moment you couldn't scroll text in both directions. You would, you would like in basic, you would list a line and then it would go by, it would go off the screen, and if you want to see it again, you would type the same thing again and it would start over. You couldn't just make it go the other way. And that actually, that turned in, you turned that into one of your products, didn't you? Uh, right. right. Yeah, yeah, actually I used that, that simple thing became the basis for a program called, I think the originally it was called the Correspondent, which was a word processor, and it was a very fast word processor because it was all in word, it, it, it was all in the assembly language, and because the characters were literally blocks of memory, everything was, was very fast. Um, and so originally it was the correspondent and later became called the right choice, W-R-I-T-E. And then Apple released a mouse for the Apple II. And so then it, the same core of the software became a program called MouseWrite, which was, in a, by, to my knowledge, the first mouse-based word processor for an Apple II. That's great. Yeah, maybe um, yeah, maybe you could talk a little bit more about the the, the different products that first Southwestern Data Systems had, and then uh, Roger Wagner Publishing, mm -hmm. and kind of what kind of um, you know what what role did they fill in the industry, or what what was their you know the different types of um, products you had? Yeah, I I know my mindset was that what I was describing earlier, which was it was really cool if you could be the first one to do something. So the very first program that I sold was pretty simple. It just it just renumbered the line. The, the, every line in Applesoft Basic has a number, but they're not one, two, three, because you want to insert something. So traditionally, you start and you number 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. When you want to insert something, you put in 25. And 23 is not too hard, but sooner or later, you get to the point where you need to insert a line, and you already used 22, 23, and there's no 22 and a half. <laughs> so you need to renumber the lines. And then also in the program, it would say, go to 120. Well, if you change line 120, that go to has to also be changed. So what I figured out, which, which was pretty clever, I think, was I figured out how to have two Applesoft basic programs in memory at the same time. So there was the program that you wanted to renumber, and then there was, because remember, I didn't actually know a lot of assembly language at the beginning. So I just wrote the whole thing in basic and then just the particular parts that needed to work in assembly language for speed. And I figured out how to have two basic programs by moving some memory pointers around in memory at the same time. So it was actually one, you had your program, you ran mine, and it magically put itself somewhere else, left yours there, made it the running program. In basic, it then scanned through your program, and then when it needed to start getting serious about the renumbering and the go-tos, it executed some assembly language code. Um, kind of proud of that. I mean, at the time, that was like 1978 or 79, and um, and I remember being frustrated that, you know, a year later, Apple gave away a renumber program, and I thought my whole career was ruined because my program. Um, but there were a few more still to be written. So I did a, a program called Roger's Easel that um, was actually one of the, to my knowledge, the first. There wasn't a paint program before mine because mine was sort of like at the Minecraft level. The first Apple II was only 40 by 40 pixels, and you, the pictures didn't look very good. There wasn't an upper, so nobody would write it. Nobody would have written a paint program at 40 by 40 pixels. Um, but I did, because there were the, the paddles, they called them paddles, the two little knobs that came attached to some wires, and you do it Etch-a-Sketch style. So um, it wasn't with a pen or anything, it was really an Etch-a-Sketch. And then the, the third one I did was called Apple Doc, and it made a list of all the variables. But it turned out that was really useful, and that actually was like the hit program for 1980 or something. You know, it was, it was, and I remember, I remember people calling and saying, "I don't care how much it costs in here, and send it FedEx. I need it tomorrow. We're working on a project." Um, and so I think the name change from Roger Wagner to South or Southwest to Roger Wagner actually happened in 1984. Um, 
And as I mentioned before, that, that had to do with just the feeling that it should be a real company and not just something in my basement uh, sort of thing. Um, and then at that point, we actually ran ads asking for programmers, saying, if you've written something interesting, send it to us. And so at one time, we, I think I, I don't know, 12 or 15 different titles um, from different people that we were all marketing, running ads for every month. Great. That's great. And so that included things also like the Merlin Assembler, yeah. uh, like uh, Glenn Braden. Mm -hmm. um, what were some other programs? Oh, there was Listmaster from Ted Burkhead. There was the Applesoft Command Editor. Um, which actually was somewhat similar to a program Call Apple was selling. There was a financial, it said financial management, but I think it really was, was sort of like QuickBooks or you know some early keep track of all your expenses. It's been a long time. Um, there were a, a large part of our products were what, what we called utilities. So Merlin's a utility, the Applesoft Command Editor's a utility. There were things for doing graphing. There was a toolbox series. Um, that were add-ons for AppleSoft, which really were rather amazing in, their, in the extent of just how many things you could add to AppleSoft. Um, and then that went until, let's see, say, probably about 86 or 87. Um, but by then the Apple II was, was reaching the end of its life. <laughs> Right. And then um, I guess that's sort of where you started to move into the Hyper Studio, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, why don't you tell us kind of how that came about? So, and, and first of all, what it is. And yeah, so what happened was I mentioned the Apple II in general was winding down. So, remember, the Macintosh came out in 1984. The Apple actually took some of the engineers that had worked on the Mac and said, go back and renovate the Apple II line. And so they took the experience of what they'd learned on the Mac and built the Apple II GS in 86. It had more resolution, it had a megabyte of memory. Um, I don't remember about speeds, but clearly it was in color. It had a 16 voice stereo MIDI synthesizer. It could digitize sound, the Mac couldn't do that. Um, it could, um, uh, with the video overlay card that I mentioned, you can uh, do like wedding videos where there's credits rolling at the end. Um, and in fact, it was from 1986 to 1992 that the Apple II was still a superior machine to anything available on the Mac. The finally, in 92, the Mac LC came out, which was the low-cost color version of a Mac. There were color Macs, but at $10,000 or something crazy. Um, and so Hyper Studio actually brought new life to the Apple II line with what you could do with it. The, the design of Hyper Studio was... Um, inspired by HyperCard, but but we, so the basic form of a screen that was called a card uh, with buttons and graphics was the same, but the environment was very different, and it really was the reason it was called Hyper Studio was because of the sort of artistic nature. HyperCard was a three by five card with links. Hyper Studio, you can think of a music studio, a painting studio. Um, a video studio, the, the word was very deliberate. And uh, um, the, the, way I, the way Hyper Studio came into existence was, you'll recall I had said we were hiring programmers. Um, the hiring, it was like a royalty. We would find programmers who had something, we'd sell it and pay them a royalty. Um, and when the GS came out, it was missing the digitizer card. It could digitize sound, but Apple didn't put that in there. Because, so it was available. With, of the, with the potential to do it, but not the actuality. So uh, one day a guy came in my office, Dave Klimas, and uh, sort of he was asking about the Merlin assembler and some macros that he'd created. And he said, uh, you know, it'd be great to do more things in, in the, with personal computers. This, this looks like a fun industry. And I said, oh, I've got a book with, a, I always write down my ideas. So I've got a book with 100 ideas you can have. I give them away for free. <laughs> Um, so I said, tell you what, there's this Apple II GS. It can digitize sound, but the board is missing. Uh, tell you what, come back uh, with a design for a circuit board that I can make for under $5, and we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll uh, see what we'll do next. So about a week later, he came back, and he had a prototype that he hand-soldered together of this little board that could digitize sound. 
And about the same time, I'd also gotten, you know, uh, had been contacted by Michael O'Keefe about a paint program he had done. Um, and we ended up putting together a team with the idea that Michael O'Keefe would do the paint program, um, Dave Klimas would do the sound, Eric Mueller um, at the time had been writing incredible things, um, probably related to Merlin, or I don't remember, but he, he, he was obviously a brilliant programmer. So I wrote to him and said, would you be willing to work on Hyperstio? In fact, you, know, you need to come down to San Diego for uh, a couple weeks just for us to put this all together. And he said, I have to ask my mom. So it turned out he was still in high school, and, uh, but he was graduating early. <laughs> Um, so he actually was able to come down to San Diego when we started Hyper Studio, and um, I believe it w the first version was released at Apple Fest in Boston, and I think the year was 88, but I get a little confused because the first version was so beta that it wasn't really till a year later in 89 that a sort of more solid version came out. So there are, there's news accounts that talk about 89, as though the program is new, but I think that's when the sort of really working version came out. I think we sold the first copies as early as 88, but um, in any event, it was fun, and we produced something that was nothing like it. Yeah, and it seemed like it was really widely used, right? And, uh, like, at, at, at one point, I forget how many users you said that were using it, especially, like, in education. Yeah, the, the surprise, in a way, was um, that... You know, originally when we when we made it, I designed it. Um, I put in these various media handling abilities. Um, it became evident that the perfect match between those abilities and the people who really could use them were schools. That students creating projects, uh, and they want to tell a story about dolphins and whales or volcanoes. They want to have a picture. They want to have a movie. They want to record their voice to talk about it. They need multiple screens to tell the story, and this was also. Strictly speaking, not before the internet, but from a practical deployment level, it was. <laughs> so the internet was not in anybody's hands to speak of. So this idea of linking things together, hypertext and hypermedia, was not yet there in a general way because of the internet. So Hyperstudio was the first program that really used nonlinear connections and a hypertext, hypermedia kind of environment. Um, and got taken up in the schools. My estimates are that somewhere between 10 and 20 million kids were using Hyperstudio by the end of the 90s. Um, just based on the by, the, by the end of the 90s, Hyperstudio was the number one title in classrooms um, worldwide. So even the 20 might be off by a factor of 10, and 50 or 100, it was, it was, it was a lot. <laughs> in fact, in some states, for instance in Colorado, if you wanted to get a master's degree in education in the 90s, it was required that you knew how to use Hyperstudio. Uh, it had become such a standard. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. And then, um, so it sounds like around 1997 is mm -hmm. when you um, ended up, I guess, selling mm -hmm. Hyperstudio, and then... The, the, the funny part in that was the reason I sold was because I thought it was only a matter of time and a very short time before what was the, what then there were big companies. So there was Microsoft, there was Apple, um, no Google yet, but um, Microsoft had PowerPoint. I thought that some big company, once we started really becoming successful, then people see, then big companies can say, oh, look at that. And they would have had the resources to, to crush us. <laughs> So I thought better to sell the company and at least uh, have some financial security for the future. Um, and so I sold it in 97. Um, they actually kept, the, you know, we sold the Knowledge Adventure and they actually kept the company intact in San Diego for almost two years after that. Um, and then at some point, this almost always happens. Um, somebody somewhere looked and said, well, wait a minute, what's this division doing in San Diego when everybody else is in L.A.? Close them down and move them up here. So they showed up one day and closed the whole place down and I think moved two people to L.A. Um, out of 50. So that was, the, that was the beginning of what we call the dark days of Hyper Studio. <laughs> it lasted about, uh, about eight years.
but yet it still survived, right? And now it's, it's... Well, yeah, what happened was it went from company to company. Sales decreased 50% each year. Um, they never updated it for Mac OS X or Windows anything. Um, and then in 2008, um, Software Mac Kiev, which is actually a major Macintosh programming uh, contract company, um, they had hyper. They had. I'm sorry. They had Print Shop and KidPix as their products that they were already distributing, and they um, came to me and said, if I would help redesign a new version of HyperC for OS X, um, then they would they would go ahead and purchase Hy the rights to HyperC from the company that had it at the time. So we did that. I'm not an owner or an employee, but I advise and design. And so since 2007, they've been rebuilding Hyper Studio um, and have done a, a, an absolutely amazing job of it. Yeah, um, that, that, that must make you really happy too, right? Yeah, to kind of yeah, it's, uh, it well, I, my life is inextricably intertwined with Hyper Studio at this point. <laughs> and so to see it, you know, supported in some way is, is a really good thing. Yeah. And it, there is nothing... As I say, there's nothing on the planet like it. It's not like anything else in that it is truly unique, a unique environment. There's nothing, you could say it's like PowerPoint, but it's just as true to say it's like comic life. I guess you could make comics, and if all you ever did was make comics with it, then you would think it was a comic program. And it's, it's not, it's Hyper Studio. <laughs> That's great. So then, um, I guess since 1997, maybe tell us a little bit about what you've been up to. And what uh, well, actually, 99. So I was with from 97 to 99. I stayed with the company. They closed it down in 99. Um, uh, it didn't actually. It was a very short period of time. I'd already taken up an interest in antique books, um, and I'd been buying books at auction. So there's a company in San Francisco called Pacific Book Auctions, and in 2000. Um, the guy that owned it uh, wanted to go do some different things and said, hey, how'd you like to have a book auction company? So, um, one way or another, I ended up with a book auction company. So I did that for 10 years, and it is it was very interesting. Every two weeks, we would have a completely different library of 1,000, 2,000, 4,000 books. One, might be one, one time might be children's book. Another time might be history of science. Another one might be just about fishing. Um, but so I continued to collect. At one time I had the largest Henry Miller collection of anyone, anywhere. That eventually was, uh, I sold my collection to the library at Yale. Um, so the Roger Wagner Henry Miller collection is now at Yale. Uh, and then uh, towards the end of that time period, I learned to fly a plane, became a private pilot, um, and these days I sort of, these days I'm sort of, uh, have a lot of irons in the fire still, so I still do Hyper Studio every day, I go to educational conferences, I'm on the board of directors of California Computer Using Educators, which is the, the state organization of teachers that's, that use computers in the classroom. Um, I do a little venture capital, a little bit of science and business advice to startups, um, I do a little bit of gardening. Um, I live sort of on the outskirts of San Diego where I have uh, enough room to have a lovely garden with some uh, orange trees and, and things like that. And uh, with respect to Hyper Studio, I'm actually working now on the maker movement and I have designed my own Arduino Shield, which is a sort of uh, app piggyback board for the Arduino that's specifically designed to be the bridge between Hyper Studio and a student project, which could be a volcano, a model of the solar system, a California mission, anything that they would physically make. Um, this little Arduino add-on lets them connect that physical model to a Hyper Studio presentation so that when the kid's talking about the volcano, it actually lights up. And then if you touch the volcano um, as a way of asking a question, the kid, the student, a video of the student will actually respond and say, oh, that's the magma chamber, and Google Earth will zoom in to where a volcano just erupted in Polynesia or something. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's pretty cool. And I've, so it's actually a bit of a, a grand circle since hyper -C has started once upon a time, a long time ago, with a, a little circuit board attached to an Apple II GS. Yeah, that's, that's great, and it, it, it seems like it's kind of full circle also in the sense that when the Apple first started, it was kind of very open, mm -hmm. you know, it was an open platform and you could 
you know, do anything you wanted mm -hmm. with it. And for a long time in the industry, that wasn't really true. Mm -hmm. But now it seems like with the maker movement and things yeah. like the Arduino, we're back where kids or mm -hmm. even adults can, again, understand something like like mm -hmm. completely, right? Mm -hmm. Where you used to be able to do that with the Apple. Yeah. And now with the Arduino. No, you're right. Actually, that is one of the biggest surprises. Five years ago, the last thing I would have predicted would have been the maker movement and hour of code. Because right? even 15 years ago, the general sentiment was programming is something we used to have to do, but now the Macintosh is here, they're so easy to use, nobody needs to know how to program. Right. So that 1984 was the beginning of the nobody ever needs to know how to program again you know, time. So it's really su pleasantly surprising um, that both a, and then also remember over the past decades, in many schools, they they got rid of wood shop, electric shop, um, auto shop. The idea that somebody would make something in high school really became less and less in favor. So the last thing I would have ever expected is in 2015, there's a maker movement where 150,000 people go to a, you know, a show, a fair, a maker fair. And in schools, what's happening is really there is a very serious discussion right now of converting libraries into maker spaces. Yep. Um, and, and kids are learning how to program again. And as you said, the maker movement philosophy is very much open source, open culture, and anybody can make anything they want. Yeah, well, I think that's wonderful. That's great. So do you have any, I don't know, predictions for the future or anything? Or things um, you'd like to see happen or, or make happen? <laughs> Um, in general, I think uh, these things often happen, the pioneers in a given field um, do their best to defend the, the open nature of it for as long as they can. So certainly there are, with computers, there are growing risks to privacy. I've actually been very active um, on the computer using educators group that I'm in to raise issues about if a student's at a school writing an essay, uh, I think what they write should be between them and their parents. And it isn't up to somebody else to be listening in on, on what the student's writing in school, um, whether that's Google or anybody else. So anyway, I think there are, there are certainly areas to be mindful of and to protect. Um, one of my predictions, it'll be interesting to see if it happens, um, that would sound totally crazy, which makes it more fun to predict, is I would say, can you think of any major technology, and by that I mean cars, radio, television, um, that ultimately did not require a license to do? So when cars were first made, airplanes, I'm a private pilot. I'm a federally licensed private pilot. At one time, the only way to have a license was to have Orville Wright sign a piece of paper. And then, eventually, if he wasn't available, if Orville Wright had signed the license of another pilot, that pilot could sign yours. That tradition has still been done today for engineering. So if a guy, a licensed engineer, comes out and builds a bridge or a, you know, a building, somebody, another engineer, signed a license that said that guy was qualified, but it's government regulated. It's an interesting question. I, I, I do... Uh, I do predict, while still finding it hard to believe myself, that, or let me just put it this way, I would not be at all surprised if someday in the future to own a suitably complex and flexible computer will require a license. Mm -hmm. That you could own a consumer, for instance, take a radio, you can own a transistor, transistor, they don't even have transistors anymore, but you could have a radio in your car, you can have a radio you buy, and you don't need a, a license to listen. You don't need a license to consume, but you do need a license to produce. Yep, that makes and sense. if computers escape that, if 50 years from now you can have a computer without a license, they will be one of the only technologies that ultimately was not licensed. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. All right, well, anything else that you want to add that oh. we didn't cover? Um, I think probably it's appropriate time to just say thank you to everyone over the many years for the support that uh, I have gotten from many wonderful people. I've got to know a lot of incredible, brilliant people. I remember being at, at Kansas Fest in the dorms late at night with 20 other people my age and various pluses and minuses to that. 
and how many of them were musicians, uh, how many of them were artists and skilled in not, you know, not just one domain. And uh, in education, I am forever thankful that the, uh, you know, the people I work with are, are educators and teachers who help kids every day. Um, so it's been, it has been a truly a marvelous adventure. Imagine being born, I, I can remember thinking, gee, I wish I was born in the time of the Wright brothers when they just invented airplanes. And what about Thomas Edison and when they were inventing all that stuff? Maybe I missed everything. And little did I know that the computer revolution would be every bit as exciting and more as uh, any of those other times. And every indication is there will be even more to come. That's great. Well, thanks so much, Roger. Well, thank it's you very much. Pleasure. All right.